So this chapter adopts an intergenerational lens to examine how the expanded educational opportunities in rural Punjab and Pakistan are mediated by the cultural complexity and the local power relations. So based on the field work in a rural community in Punjab, this chapter makes a number of arguments. Starting point is that schooling is an integral part of the family's long-term intergenerational goal of achieving social mobility. It is valuable as long as it helps them achieve this goal, but when it fails to offer them a credible route out of poverty and towards dignified living, it loses its values in the lives of the poor. And this is one crucial point which is often ignored by the supply-driven educational reforms. So within rural Punjab, individuals' life chances in and through education are strongly shaped by a set of mutually reinforcing social hierarchies, what I call in this chapter as the pentagonal rural social structure, which consists of land ownership, caste and kinship, religious identity, patriarchy, and the politics of patronage. So various positions held within the social structure generate different resources, opportunities, and constraints for, the, for acquiring and using schooling for its economic and social outcomes. The evidence from rural Punjab indicates that the values and meanings attached to social mobility and what schooling could do to achieve social mobility are differentiated along the lines of one's position within this social structure. The landed and the landless, the upper and the low caste, the, and the religious majority and the minority, for example, had different educational and economic goals and resources to pursue these goals. And similarly, schooling was understood to differently prepare uh, sons and daughters for their respective roles in the community, in the economy, and the households, reinforcing the sexual division of labor and perpetuating uh, gender inequality in and through education. So poverty and social inequality generate different, differentiated values, meanings, desires, and schooling decisions amongst unequally positioned families with often compounding effects on their strategies to use schooling to improve their living conditions. But even the most marginalized families had high desires for achieving social mobility through the schooling of their sons and daughters. However, they learned from their own experiences and that of similar, those similar to them, what schooling in reality could do to expand economic possibilities for them and improve their overall life chances. Such learnings influence their educational aspirations and strategies, with many withdrawing from the educational system and looking for alternative strategies. The relatively privileged had higher goals and better navigational capacity and resources to achieve these goals through education. The material realities of the disadvantage, however, force them to lower their aspirations down to the level suitable for people like them. Educational outcomes were governed by the oppressive social relations prevailing in the labor market and elsewhere that limited the ability of the poor to make schooling work for them. The case studies offered in this chapter indicate the deepening of the sense of betrayal, social exclusion, the internalization of failure amongst the disadvantaged, and a widening of the gap from those favorably positioned in the local social order. This complex interplay between cultural, economic, and social conditions and resources, and how individuals understood them, can leave schooling as a mechanism for social reproduction. 
capable of perpetuating existing inequalities rather than encouraging social mobility. So for schooling to be a viable investment strategy, it must offer these poor, landless, socially excluded families a credible route towards improvement in their economic conditions and a respect, respectable social status. The wider social, cultural, and economic context, if not transformed, have the capacity to overpower the opportunities that schooling might have offered to the poor. So without creating a level playing field as a precondition, there is a little that schooling alone can achieve in reducing inequality and eradicating poverty in contexts such as rural Punjab. So this research builds on uh, the previous research uh, uh, called Youth, Gender and Citizenship Study, which was part of a larger research uh, program, uh, the Research Consortium on Educational Outcomes and Poverty, RECOOP, uh, which was led by Chris Kulkulov. And the findings of that uh, research program have been uh, published uh, in the monograph by Chris Kulkulov himself, uh, The Educational Outcomes and Poverty Reassessment. I was one of the members of the research team at the Mahbubur Haq Human Development Center during recoup research in Pakistan. The author chapter eight, together with Professor Roger Jeffrey, who was the lead co-investigator for the University of Edinburgh in recoup. In chapter eight, we explored how changing socioeconomic environments and the increasing schooling of children inflect the dynamics of intergenerational contracts and influence social inequality in Punjab and Pakistan. In doing so, we focused on our analysis on fertility attitudes and behavior of young women and the transformations in Punjabi family and gender systems. What are the pathways through which female schooling might act as a means to reduce social inequalities within and beyond the existing gender and family systems? The question that we try to answer. In the chapter, we employ the mixed methods approach. We used demographic and health surveys of Pakistan for 1990 2006-2007, and 2012-2013. Demographic and health surveys are nationally representative surveys which provided us data for fertility attitudes and behavior of more than 1,500 young Punjabi women for each year. It also enabled us to describe the relationship between schooling and fertility attitudes and behavior and changes in these over time. We also utilized two qualitative studies conducted in Sargoda Punjab to explore the role of schooling in transforming family relationships and revealing a deeper set of changes in young wives' lives in Punjab resulting from their education. Using these studies, we were able to focus on young wives' aspirations as parents for their own children, despite the increasing costs of schooling. First one of these studies is the Health and Fertility Study, which was a part of Research Consortium on Educational Outcomes and Poverty Research, led by Christopher Kolkulo. The Health and Fertility Study aimed at exploring the relationships between schooling and the health and fertility related behavior of poor households, particularly focusing on how female schooling influenced the reproductive citizenship, women's agency, and empowerment in poor communities. Under this study, we conducted 35 semi-structured interviews in Punjab with young women living in rural and urban areas in Sargoda in 2008. The second qualitative study is a part of my PhD research, which was a follow-up of recoup research and investigated the social processes underpinning the fertility decline with a focus on intergenerational relationships and the transformations in the gender and family systems, again in Sargoda in Punjab. Um, I collected the data through semi-structured interviews with 24 young women and their mothers and mothers-in-law in 2010 and 11. Uh, here in this study, we only included the uh, interviews with the young 24 young women. 
The interviews provided information on the reasons for fertility change, how production is negotiated within the existing power hierarchies in the family, and how familial relationships evolve to adjust these changes. Our analysis showed that schooling clearly had a significant impact on young Punjabi women's attitudes to fertility and to their behavior in relation to pregnancy and childbearing. While there have been declines in fertility rates and increases in contraceptive prevalence rates among all women, the rate of these improvements was much faster among women without schooling as compared to women with schooling. This suggested that the strong inverse relationship between women's schooling and her desired fertility was breaking down in contemporary Punjab, partly with respect to desired family size, but also entirely with respect to contraceptive use, both in rural and urban areas. Our qualitative interviews also indicated that women from both urban and rural backgrounds and with different levels of schooling were indeed actively involved in decisions about their fertility and wanted to limit the number of children in Punjab. These findings, although indicated a decreasing role of women's schooling on fertility, our qualitative interviews also suggested that this would be wrong, and the pathways through which schooling influenced these decisions were rather more complex and cannot be considered without also analyzing the changes occurring in the wider social, economic, and familial context. Punjabi families and gender systems were transforming. Although female schooling did not fully tackle the intra-household gender inequalities, it weakened the effect of gender inequalities for women with schooling by changing the distribution of labor among women within the households, by eliminating some of the constraints on women's mobility, or by allowing women to have higher say in decisions that are central to their reproductive lives. In addition, increasing availability of schools and the demand for schooling for, of girls indeed have contributed to subtle but cumulatively significant transformations in micro level gender inequalities and family dynamics, irrespective of schooling levels achieved by their mothers. Similarly, with the expansion of facilities in education and health sectors, both in rural and urban areas, even young women from the more marginalized families had high aspirations for a better life for themselves and their children. Within Punjabi household, there were households, there was a common ground that education is absolutely necessary. And the best possible education should be provided for children of both sexes. This increased the cost of living for the couples who wanted to invest in the schooling of sons and daughters alike. Even the economic pressures that were felt as increasing costs of child rearing, women thought that small families were necessary. Given these, in chapter eight, we argue that while women's schooling led to subtle transformations in gender and family systems, what pressurized all women to limit their fertility, irrespective of their own schooling, was their aspirations for children's schooling rather than the schooling they had themselves experienced. The schooling of children had become more important than mother's schooling in influencing couples' fertility decisions. And as the aspirations of parents for children's upward mobility emerged. I met with Chris in 2006 during the research consortium on education outcomes and poverty fieldwork. Later, together with Roger, we have expanded the recoup health and fertility study during my PhD. Chris, with his commitment uh, and support for girls schooling and his intellectual leadership benefited both of us enormously. Thank you, Chris. Together with Professor Grace Pantebia Chomohendo, also from the School of Women and Gender Studies, we contributed a chapter on teenage pregnancy and social inequality, an impediment for attaining schooling for all in Uganda, which is chapter nine. 
We note that achieving uh, schooling for all has been a major goal for many African countries, including Uganda. However, gender disparities remain a concern, especially at secondary and higher education levels. Our chapter presents evidence showing that teenage pregnancy is a major impediment to girls' education attainment in many African countries, including Uganda. Yet the effects of teenage pregnancy on schooling have received limited attention in global discourses. The chapter draws on quantitative and qualitative data from studies conducted in Uganda to identify the two-way relationship between teenage pregnancy and girls' education and the factors that continue to hold back educational progress for girls from disadvantaged backgrounds. Our chapter highlights the importance of bringing teenage pregnancy into debates about education's role in reducing social and economic inequality. We explore the educational challenges associated with teenage pregnancy, which increase and aggravate the social and economic disadvantages that girls face. We note that in Sub-Saharan Africa, teenage pregnancies are high and in Uganda, teenage pregnancy has stagnated at 25% for the last 15 years since uh, 2006. Teenage pregnancy is still influenced by multiple factors related to social and economic inequality, which include poverty and limited resources, negative social norms and beliefs that place high value on marriage and motherhood, parents' failure to counsel and guide their children on the dangers of early marriage and sex, sexual harassment from boys and teachers within school and in the community, and limited provision of sexuality and life skills education. Once a girl gets pregnant, she definitely drops out of school. And in most cases, she's forced to marry the boy or the man that has made her pregnant, even when it was not the plan. In our chapter, we reflect on the plethora of Ugandan legislative reforms and policies and the prevention strategies that aim to prevent girls from early child bearing. In our research, we found that in reality, adherence to the existing legal provisions and policies remains a challenge. Our research indicates ineffective and inconsistent enforcement of the policies and laws and the implementation of some of the policy initiatives, particularly those that are related to provision of sexual and reproductive health information, faces resistance from cultural and religious institutions and some parents. There has been a minimal progress in implementation of the interventions to address teenage pregnancy and girls' education. With most programs, um, that are often short term and have limited coverage. Further, the initiatives are not anchored in the ecological approach that stresses the need to address issues of teenage pregnancy across the different levels of adolescent girls' ecology. In our chapter, we stress the fact that without concrete action, Teenage pregnancy is likely to reinforce the effects of social inequality in education. We recommend that initiatives to address teenage pregnancy should target the multiple social and economic factors that exist within the girls' environment. 
Education is a key strategy for enhancing girls' life skills and aspirations, for delaying engagement in early sex, and encouraging social values that envision a different future for the girl beyond childbearing. This, however, requires education beyond the adolescent girl herself to include other people in her, in, in her environment, including parents, boys, men, and other people within the community. This chapter builds on gender and primary schooling in Uganda, the GAPS project that was led by Christopher Kokloff in collaboration with FAWE under the Partnership for Strategic Resource Planning for Girls' Education in Africa in partnership with the Institute for Development Studies at IDS in the late 1990s. Uganda was one of the countries of focus because of the persistent gender inequalities in education access and attainment at the time, especially for the girls. Thank you for listening to me. Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Leslie Casey Hayford. I'm one of the co-authors of the chapter on parental and learner experiences and choices in Ghana's northern region. Um, the, wrote, the article was written by two other authors, um, Mr. Justice Ajay Korte and Mr. Adam Basi Garte. Um, the chapter is really an exploration of the choices that parents make in order to send their children to areas of the country that would be considered extreme poverty zones. Especially in these extreme poverty zones, there have been a growing number of alternative education processes going on in those zones. And um, the chapter explores one of the government's flagship programs called Complementary Basic Education, which was really, um, it, its nascent um, processes were founded by civil society groups in the north of Ghana, School for Life, AfriKids, and other NGOs like ActionAid. We're, we're testing out these processes in the 1990s, early 2000s, before the Ghana government took over complementary basic education programming. Um, the civil society movement is still um, innovating and using these alternative education pathways for children in remote rural areas um, since 1995. And they aim pre predominantly to improve the quality of basic education for children in those areas. These areas are often, as I mentioned, poverty endemic, and um, at least a, a third or sometimes even half the family is unable to send and support their children going to formal education. So through non-formal education and alternative pathways, um, like complementary basic education, alternative education programming, you find a growing number of children between the ages of eight and 14 accessing these programs in across sub-Saharan Africa. So Ghana was the case study for this, for this chapter, where we conducted research for over about a three month period of which one month was spent in field work in the remote areas of the northern region, Gushigu, um, also in Pusaga district in the upper east, and then um, Jirapa in the upper west. The teams were three in number and the chapter focuses on two of those regions, the factors that were really inspiring and, and you know, encouraging and motivating parents to choose between primary education or alternative um, education modalities like complementary basic education. The chapter explores a number of factors that um, support these choices that parents make. We look at the contextual factors such as gender, religion, ethnicity, and even the family makeup in terms of the number of children each wife is having and the selection of children that do attend and those that do not attend, what their profile is. We looked at the livelihood patterns of these families, their farming um, activities, their um, weaving and handicraft activities. We also looked at their 
a participation in and out of school, the distance to school, to the nearest formal school, the, the, the financial strength and income of the family, as well as some of the high quality factors and fee-free factors that were inspiring parents to sometimes opt for alternative um, complementary basic education. We also looked at the flexible nature that complementary basic education affords children that are in the most remote and extreme poverty zones where without having to often um, sacrifice their labor on the farm with the family, they're able to attend in the afternoon classes that will enable them to both learn and acquire basic literacy and numeracy within about a nine month period. So some of the reflections from this um, study and some of the findings suggest that in the Gushigu district with a high incidence of out-of-school children and in the Pusuga district as well, with a relatively low incidence or lower incidence, the communities were in great difficulty to send all their children to school. Because of their farming, because of the food insecurity in these two regions, it was difficult to not only allow some children to access primary school, but to enable them to complete primary school and sustain them through the basic education sphere. And this evidence has been growing over the last 20 years. We're seeing more and more evidence that not all children can complete primary and junior high school education in Ghana and other countries around Sub-Saharan Africa. The high level of food insecurity and their reliance on children to work in the family and sustain the family and often sustain other children who are attending primary school was also um, one of the reasons behind children's opting to um, use alternative complementary basic education. Um, that didn't mean that they didn't support children that had completed the uh, complementary basic education program, but it just meant that after they completed the majority of those children did, did opt to go into the formal private pr primary school system. So at ages um, you know, 8 to 15, often they were reintroduced to, into formal basic education at the upper primary levels, P4, P5, P6. Also, the uh, main finding was, of course, that parents were having great difficulty affording the direct and indirect costs of education. So once they completed complementary basic education, it was also a question of sustainability, whether children could stay in the formal basic system because of these indirect costs. Some of them were, of course, feeding, some of them transport allowances, sometimes often just uniforms and shoes. These were um, some of the motivating or demotivating factors for parents to support children in those systems. How does this chapter relate to Chris Kalkoff's work over the last 30 years? Well, um, we, we, I was fortunate to work under Chris as a student, and I know that he always pushed us as students to do the deep dive in qualitative research, even though he was an economist. Um, he was very influential in our work in ethnographic education work in Ghana. And this chapter in many ways is a good example of the kind of work he liked to read and to also encourage us to pursue. Thank you very much. In this chapter in the book, my aim is to exemplify the tensions, challenges and opportunities accorded in the inclusion of children with disabilities in mainstream classrooms, particularly the given focus on inclusive education in India. I critically examine how the educational interests of children with disabilities are enacted in mainstream schools in Karnataka or the southern state in India. In doing so, I draw on the dilemmas of difference framework. Dilemmas of difference was proposed by Martha Minow, and I use it as an analytical tool in this chapter to really begin to answer the central question. When does treating children differently emphasize the differences and stigmatize or hinder them on that basis? And when does treating children the same become insensitive to the difference and likely to stigmatize or hinder them on that basis? In responding to this dilemma, I look at three different aspects. The identification issue, the curriculum dilemma, and indeed the location dilemma. So based on teacher interviews, 
and classroom observations, this chapter unravels how these various dilemmas were placed out, played out in the classroom. In my analysis, I conclude that there is no ideal resolution to these dilemmas as tensions occur between the values of inclusion and individuality in all these three dilemmas. However, engaging with these dilemmas is really important as a deeper analysis helps us better understand the decisions that teachers make and indeed how we can better support them and school systems in which they operate. The key takeaway messages from this chapter, which I've highlighted on this slide are, poverty and disability are not simply barriers to accessing schooling. Rather, many deficit assumptions made about children with disabilities and indeed children coming from poor families permeate classroom processes and teacher practices. Additionally, teacher practices and perspectives as we saw them enacted in the classroom, are not necessarily driven by a rejection of children with disabilities. Rather, what they highlight are the many quandaries that teachers face as they navigate teaching and learning in complex and resource constrained classrooms. What I conclude in the chapter is I argue that educational reform efforts need to be underpinned by values of social belonging, acceptance, and dignity rather than universalistic and idealistic notions of inclusive education. And that inclusive education is not necessarily one size fits all, but a deeper understanding of context is extremely important in operationalizing a socially just inclusive system. The genesis of the work presented in this chapter builds on the disability work under the aegis of the research consortium on Educational Outcomes and Poverty, or RICU, led by Chris in 2005 to 2002. At a time when disability was not acknowledged as being part of mainstream education and development debates, Chris really had the foresight to have a whole sub-project focused on disability as part of this consortium. So the Disability Education and Poverty Project in RICU has paved the way for all the work we now do on disability education in the Global South at the Faculty of Education at Cambridge. In this chapter, we want to understand how teachers' beliefs about students can impact student learning. In doing so, we demonstrate ways in which social distance between teachers and students can reproduce disadvantage for those who are from marginalized backgrounds. This study has real-time relevance as classrooms are increasingly diverse as efforts to enroll children from the lowest economic strata and those with disabilities in mainstream classrooms have succeeded over the past decade or so. Having an accurate and complete understanding of the factors that can improve teaching practice, particularly for children from marginalized backgrounds, is crucial for making decisions about the types of policies to put in place to promote equality in education and for improving learning. While considerable work has been done on the contribution of observable teacher characteristics to learning, such as experience, qualification, and content knowledge, relatively little is known about the more latent variables, such as teachers' beliefs and the ways in which these link with their practice. Drawing on existing scholarship, we develop a framework that links teachers' beliefs about students with their teaching practice via two channels. First, teachers' beliefs about a child's capacity to learn inform their expectation about the child's performance. In other words, the notion of a good student or a bad student sets a benchmark for how well a student can do. These expectations are apparent to students who then determine their level of effort to meet them. The second channel predicts that teacher effort varies for different students. In case teacher effort is lower with students who are struggling, their outcomes are likely to be even lower. We use data from interviews with 220 teachers and 144 classroom observations in government schools in India and Pakistan to illustrate teachers' beliefs about their students, expectations about their learning potential, and on ways in which teaching practices vary for different students. 
we find that teachers interviewed in India and Pakistan believe very strongly that parental background is a key determining factor of a child's capacity to learn and to do well in class. A teacher's conceptualization of a good student as someone who is intelligent, confident, interactive, attends regularly, and comes prepared from home. These characteristics that are more likely to be present in children from socially and economically stable and well-off homes, somewhat similar to teachers' own background. Teachers expect that these children will learn more and that they will do better than others in the same classroom. A majority of teachers agree that children whose parents are not literate have the most difficulty in learning. They expect children of parents with low levels of education or low income to have a lower capability of learning. Classroom observations show that rather than focusing more on students who have lower learning levels and who are less likely to participate in classrooms on their own, teachers engage more with students who are more motivated, active, and engaged in the classroom to begin with. The first group, or the former group, is not openly excluded, but rather there's more of a silent process of non-inclusion. These findings show that the experience of learning for a majority of children from marginalized backgrounds is qualitatively poorer than their more privileged counterparts. And that rather than mitigating disadvantage stemming from poverty, location, and disability, teachers may be reproducing such disadvantages. This work hopes to build on the work Chris Goldfrog did to uncover and document processes that perpetuate disadvantage and inequality. 